In this video, we'll be continuing the topic, how do stars shine? This video will cover why do stars shine and how long do they live? This lecture will be presented by Dr. John T. Horner. Welcome to the third video for this topic. In this short video, we'll be talking about the reasons that stars shine and how long stars live for. Where we're gonna start with this is a brief reminder that in topic 11, the most recent topic you studied, you talked about nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. And you didn't really go into too much depth about nuclear fusion, which is going to be the cornerstone of this video. Essentially, nuclear fission, which is what happens in nuclear power plants on Earth, is when you get very massive atomic nuclei, like uranium, and they're broken into pieces, and as a byproduct of them being smashed into smaller atoms, you get energy released. And this works for very massive nuclei, basically for anything more massive than iron, if you smash that into smaller pieces, you should release more energy than you put in. And that's the whole idea of nuclear fission, where you have massive atoms and you smash them into smaller ones. Nuclear fusion is the other way around. You take very small atomic nuclei and smash them together, and they stick together to form more massive nuclei, and in the process, give off energy. And that works for atomic nuclei smaller than iron. Iron is a magic point at which if you, make if you take nuclei smaller than iron and ram them together, if you fuse them together, you will create more energy than you use. If you take atoms that are more massive than iron and smash them apart, you will release more energy than you use to smash them. But iron itself, if you try and fuse nuclei of iron together, you will have to put more energy in to fuse them than will be released by them being fused together. If you try and smash nuclei of iron apart, the pieces that you create, the amount of energy you have to put in to smash the iron apart will be greater than the amount of energy released by the fission of iron. So iron is the point where the efficiency turns over from fusion being a good way to create energy to fission being a good way to create energy. The most efficient fuel for nuclear fusion, the fuel which creates the most amount of energy per reaction, is hydrogen. And that's the key to our story of how stars shine. Nuclear fusion is actually an incredible source of energy. It's one of the most efficient ways that we know of to create energy, full stop. In fact, the only thing that gives off more energy as a function of the amount of material you're using to create the energy is if you were to annihilate particles with antiparticles and totally destroy them. That obviously is not feasible. It's very difficult to manufacture antimatter. So we won't really consider the destruction of particles and antiparticles. Other than that, nuclear fusion is the single best method for creating energy that we know of. In fact, it's so efficient that if you took all of the hydrogen in a small bucket of water and you were able to make nuclear fusion work with just that amount of hydrogen, that would create more than enough energy to power the United Kingdom for over 100 years. It's an incredibly efficient power source. If we could perfect nuclear fusion then, we'd, be, we'd have no worries about energy on the Earth. We wouldn't need to worry about burning fossil fuels. We wouldn't really need to create solar panels or wind turbines, things like that. Fusion would be the answer to everything. And so for a long time, people have been researching nuclear fusion, trying to build nuclear fusion power plants. When I was at school 20 years ago, we were told that nuclear fusion would be viable in 20 years' time. When I was at university 10 years ago, we were told that nuclear fusion would be viable in 20 years' time. And today, we're still told that nuclear fusion will be viable in 20 years' time. It's going backwards at one year per year. And that's because it's technologically an incredibly challenging thing to achieve on Earth. In order to get nuclear fusion to happen, you need to have incredibly high temperatures, tens of millions of degrees Kelvin. You also need incredibly high pressures, many hundreds of millions of times the pressure on Earth. So trying to do this on Earth in a power station is incredibly difficult because how do you keep things that are that hot and that high pressure from just exploding out, cooling down, depressurizing? It's very challenging. One place in the universe where you do get those kind of temperatures and pressures though is at the center of stars like our sun. So our sun is incredibly massive. Whereas the Earth is only around six times 10 to the 24 kilos, the sun is about two times 10 to the 30 kilos. So the sun is much more massive than all of the planets and all of the other objects in our solar system put together. 
by many orders of magnitude. What that means is that the gravitational pull of the Sun is incredibly strong, which is why the planets go around the Sun, why the Earth goes around the Sun once per year. But that also means that the material that makes up the Sun is compressed to very high pressure and very high temperature as gravity tries to cause it to collapse in amongst itself. And that pressure and temperature at the core of the Sun is so high that nuclear fusion can take place readily. Now obviously it's very challenging for us to try to measure the temperature and pressure at the centre of the Sun. So the values we have for the pressure and temperature at the centre of the Sun have been worked out by scientific models, by people trying to work out from the information we can observe about the surface of the Sun and the things we know about its mass, what the temperature and pressure are likely to be. And our best estimates of those values are that the core of the Sun, the centre of the Sun, has a temperature of 15 million degrees Kelvin and a pressure several hundred million times that of the atmosphere on Earth. So the core of the Sun is incredibly hot and incredibly dense. And in those conditions, the electrons are stripped from all atoms, which leaves you with ionised gas. You have atomic nuclei flying around and you have electrons flying around. And that's what we call a plasma. And in that plasma, the hydrogen atoms are being fused to create helium atoms, and that's the source of the Sun's energy. Now, the Sun is primarily made of hydrogen. If you took every atom of every species inside the Sun and put them into different piles, more than 90% of the atoms you pick will be atoms of hydrogen. Of the remaining 9% of atoms, about 8% are helium, and all of the other atoms combined, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, every other type of atomic species you can think of, combined come to less than 1% of the number of atoms inside the Sun. Now, because hydrogen is the lightest of the elements, even though more than 90% of the atoms are hydrogen atoms, the Sun is only about 70% hydrogen by mass. What that means, though, is that the Sun has an incredible amount of hydrogen atoms, and that's the fuel that the Sun burns through nuclear fusion to shine as brightly as it does. Now, as I said, the temperatures in the core are so high that you have this plasma. You have hydrogen nuclei then flying around very high velocities, colliding with each other at very high speeds. And of course, a hydrogen nucleus is just a proton. The fusion in the Sun's core is taking the protons, this sea of protons that are crashing into each other at incredibly high speed, and turning them gradually into helium nuclei. And it's that process that not only powers the Sun, but powers more than 99.9% .9 of all of the known stars in the universe. A tiny fraction of very elderly stars will burn helium or the heavier elements in their nuclear fusion during their old age. But that's only for a very short fraction of their lifetime. So we're not going to really talk about that anymore here. But obviously those of you who are interested can go away and look up and find more information out about that in your own time. But the great majority of stars are powered by the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Now, different stars, depending on their masses, will go through that process of turning hydrogen to helium through slightly different routes, depending on what else is around. Some stars use other atoms as a catalyst to speed the process up. But the great majority of stars, and certainly stars like our Sun, fuse hydrogen to helium through a route that we call the proton-proton chain. And that's illustrated in this figure here. As I say, the core of the Sun comprises primarily of hydrogen nuclei, protons, flying around at very high velocities. And the start of the proton-proton chain occurs when two protons collide with one another, and they collide sufficiently strongly to stick together. When they stick together, they release a positron, which is the antimatter version of an electron, and that process turns one of those protons into a neutron. So moving away from this collision, you have a nucleus of deuterium, or heavy hydrogen, which has one proton and one neutron very closely bound together, and a positron flying off into the rest of the Sun's core. Now, in the Sun's core, you have a huge number of electrons, so that positron won't have to travel very far at all before it meets an electron, its antimatter-matter component, the partner atom, before that positron will run into an electron, and the two will annihilate one another. The electron is the matter version of the charged particle, the positron is the antimatter version of the same particle. And when they collide, they annihilate one another and give off a gamma ray of very high energy, carrying a lot of radiation away from the reaction. That reaction creating a deuterium nucleus from two protons occurs at 
all the time inside the sun. So you're gradually adding deuterium nuclei. And it doesn't take very long before one of these deuterium nuclei runs into another proton, and the two stick together once again. And that creates a nucleus of what we call helium-3. It has two protons and one neutron. So you've now created one nucleus of helium-3 from three protons. When you've created two helium-3 nuclei, those two can stick together if they collide with one another. And that collision creates a nucleus of helium with two protons and two neutrons. And the two protons that are left over go flying off back into the sea of protons that are floating around in the sun. And this is a very efficient process by which the sun creates energy. To illustrate where that energy comes from, we're now very able, thanks to the wonders of very complicated particle physics experiments, to measure the mass of helium and hydrogen nuclei to an incredibly high precision. So the mass of a helium nucleus, we can say, is 6.644 six five six seven five times ten to the minus twenty seven kilograms which you can see here the mass of a hydrogen nucleus a hydrogen nucleus is just a proton is one point six seven two six two one seven eight times ten to the minus twenty seven kilograms which means that if you merge for if you had four hydrogen nuclei four protons which is what you put in at the start of the proton proton chain those added together would have a cumulative mass of 6.690487712 times 10 to the minus 27. In other words, the mass of four hydrogen atoms is greater than the mass of one helium nucleus. Sorry, the, in other words, the mass of four hydrogen nuclei is greater than the mass of one helium nucleus. If you add four hydrogen nuclei together, you get 6.69 times 10 to the minus 27 kilos, but the four, the helium nucleus was just 6.64 times 10 to the minus 27 kilos. That difference in mass, the missing mass, is about 4.583037 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. And that's the difference in mass between one helium nucleus and the four protons that went into the formation of that nucleus. And it's that missing mass that provides the energy which is radiated by the sun every second. We can work out how much energy is radiated by that one fusion process between those four hydrogen nuclei using Einstein's very famous energy mass equivalence equation, which is E, the energy, is equal to the mass times the square of the speed of light, C squared. So if you put the numbers in here, the amount of energy created by annihilating 4.583037 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms the speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Put those numbers together, you get an energy release of 4.124333 times 10 to the minus 12 joules, or to three significant figures, 4.12 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. Now that doesn't sound that large an amount of energy, but if you think that's the amount of energy that was created by just one single fusion reaction. That's the power source of the sun, so 4.58 times 10 to the 29 kilograms of mass destroyed gives you 4.12 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. In order to maintain the current luminosity of the sun, the amount of radiation the sun gets rid of every second, the sun is therefore burning hydrogen at a very ferocious rate. And it means that the sun is currently losing mass by converting it into radiation at a rate of about 4 million tonnes per second. Now that sounds like a huge amount of mass. But you have to remember the sun is incredibly massive. Its current mass is about 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, or 2 times 10 to the 27 tons. So 4 million tons per second, if you calculated the amount of time that it would take for the sun to entirely annihilate itself, it would have enough fuel to last for 15 million million years, or 15 trillion years. Now obviously in reality, the sun wouldn't lose all its mass because it would be converted to other species, helium, the helium might be burnt later on, but it's not going to lose all of that mass, but it's certainly not going to run out of fuel anytime soon. And in fact, stars come to the ends of their lives before they've burned all their fuel. In fact, they only burn the hydrogen that's in their core. They don't effectively, they don't efficiently mix the hydrogen from their outer layers to the lower levels very much. So a star's lifetime is only really governed by the amount of fuel near the center of the star, the amount of hydrogen there. 
What that means is that the lifetime of our sun, despite the fact it has all this fuel, will only be about 10 billion years long, give or take a little bit. We're talking 10,000 million years. At the moment, the Earth and the solar system are about 4,500 million years old, which means we're effectively a middle-aged planetary system. If you assume that a person will live to 100, we're currently 45 years old, there or thereabouts. One thing to note here is that the lives of stars are therefore so incredibly long that we can't just observe one star and from that star work out the story of how stars live and how stars die. What we've instead got to do is build our theory by looking at millions of stars all at once. The analogy here would be to imagine we get an alien species and we drop this alien in the middle of Centennial Park and say you have 10 minutes to observe human beings and from that 10 minutes you have to tell us how humans are born, how they live and how they die. Now obviously any one person in Centennial Park will not give birth to a child in that 10 minutes, it's very unlikely. Similarly, it's very unlikely you'll see somebody die, you won't know it's people aging. But what our alien would see if Centennial Park was busy, if it was a nice sunny day, would be babies, they'd see children, they'd see adults and they'd see elderly people walking around. And with a little bit of logic and a little bit of reasoning, they could probably work out that humans are born as very small humans, on a quite rare event, they age very slowly, they live, they are children, they are adults, they finally become elderly, and you would assume that they die, but you don't see it happen. And that's essentially how we've worked out the story of how stars live and die. So this photograph here, which is taken from the wonderful Astronomy Picture of the Day website, is an image of our galaxy. Taken, we're obviously within our galaxy, we're looking out at the galaxy. And this is a compilation of photographs taken across the whole of the night sky that you could see from Earth, the full 360 degrees around the Earth. I'll just let you take it in for a second and then I'll explain a little bit more about it. So what you can see here, if you remember back to the picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy back in an earlier video as part of this topic, that was a spiral galaxy and we were looking at it face on. If you turn the galaxy edge on, that galaxy would look like two fried eggs stuck back to back. At the centre of the galaxy, you'd have a bulge, the yellowish part, which would be like the yolks of the two fried eggs, and the spiral arms will come out in a very flat disc, like the white of the two fried eggs. So if we go back to the picture now, you can see that although we're inside the galaxy, um, we can still see some of this structure. So the centre of the picture is looking towards the centre of our galaxy in the direction of the constellation Scorpius in the night sky and Scorpius is particularly visible directly overhead from Sydney in the moon months of May, June and July in the evenings. The centre of the galaxy is there, so the best chance for you to see the Milky Way would be to go out on a winter's night in Australia and look straight up. The better the dark side you're at, the better the view you'll get. But you can see the centre of our galaxy there looks bulge-like, looks a bit yellower, and as you move out along the disk of our galaxy, you can see that these spiral arms are vaguely blue-coloured with big patches of pink nebulosity, very much like the galaxy we looked at earlier on. The key point from this, though, is that our galaxy is a medium-sized galaxy. It's not particularly unusually big. It's certainly not one of the smaller galaxies. It's a little bit on the heavy side. Our galaxy contains something like 100,000 million stars, possibly 200,000 million stars. And that means that instead of dropping our alien in Centennial Park, we've dropped them in a very populous country with 200 million people and allow them to see all those people at once. And you can imagine that if you could see that many people all at once, you'd be able to build up a very good picture of the way that different people live and die. So that's how we've learned about stars. Where we're going with this is that different stars look different. They have different physical characteristics. And this all comes down to the mass of the star. The more massive the star is, the stronger its gravitational pull is, and so the higher the temperature and the pressure in its core will be once it reaches equilibrium with the fusion going on. Because you have a much higher temperature and pressure in the centre of the star, the rate at which the fusion occurs will be much higher. And what that means is that the engine in the star will be burning fuel much more quickly and producing much more energy in a given amount of time. So that means that that star will be much brighter than a star of lower mass. In fact, we can go further than that. For stars like the Sun, the luminosity of the star, the brightness of the star, is proportional to the mass of the star to the fourth power, which is quite a remarkable increase in luminosity for a small increase in mass. 
if you increased the mass of a star like the sun, if you doubled it and made a star that was twice as massive as the sun, the luminosity of that star would be 16 times the luminosity of the sun. That's two to the power four. So that's two squared is four, two to the power three is eight, two to the power four is 16. So a star twice as massive as our sun is 16 times more luminous. If you put them the same distance away, that star would be 16 times brighter than the sun. Now, that's how luminous a star is, that's how quickly it's burning its fuel. But the amount of fuel the star has is just limited by the amount of mass the star has, since the star's burning the hydrogen in its core. So the amount of fuel available to a star is simply proportional to the mass of the star. So we now have two very vague proportionalities, vague relations. On the one hand, we can say quite easily that the lifetime of a star would be proportional to the mass of the star, which is how much fuel it has, divided by the rate at which it burns that fuel. But the amount of fuel that the star has is simply its mass. The luminosity of the star is the rate at which it burns the fuel, and that's proportional to the mass to the fourth power. So we can therefore say that the lifetime of the star is proportional to the mass of the star, the amount of fuel, divided by the mass of the star to the fourth power, which is the rate at which the fuel is burned, which gives us a vague proportionality that is the lifetime is proportional to one divided by the mass of the star cubed. So what that means for our two solar mass star is that the luminosity, the brightness of that two solar mass star would be 16 times the luminosity of our sun. But the lifetime of that star would be one divided by two cubed times the lifetime of our sun. So that's one eighth the life of our sun. So what that means is that our two solar mass star would be much brighter than our sun, but instead of living for 10 billion years, it would probably only live for about one and a half billion years before it came to the end of its life. So in other words, massive stars live fast and die young. And that's a good way to end the third video. So in the next video, we'll move on from understanding how stars are powered and how their lifetimes vary dependent on their mass to talking about the color of stars and what we can learn by looking at their spectra. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming and editing this video. Also thanks to these people who provided photos with a Creative Commons license that we made use of.